from Boston and welcome to Machine Learning from Data Science. I'm Bob Exafari and I have the honor of hosting Professor Shah today for uh, our webinar on uh, machine learning from data to decision. The plan for, uh, the plan for today's webinar would be a, a brief introduction by Professor Shah on the, the, the details of the course, the topics that we will be having then I'll give you a little overview of the program in terms of the modules that you have, in terms of the assessments, and we would wrap up with some Q&A that you may be having. Just uh, a couple of uh, notes. Uh, you can post your questions under Q&A. As you would see, there is a chat box, there is a Q&A. Please post your questions under Q&A. It's going to be easier for us to moderate those. And towards the end of the webinar after you log out there will be a survey please make sure to take that survey um, your feedback is very valuable for us professor shah is a professor of electrical engineering and computer science and director of the statistics and data science uh, center at mit thank you so much for joining us today thank you and uh, and i've been learning facilitator for this course since its launch uh, with that uh, i'll pass the floor to professor shah to uh, talk a little bit about the course itself. Okay, well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Bobak. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, I, if you're on, on our time zone, this is early morning. If you're on the West Coast, maybe it's really early morning. And if you are uh, somewhere in Singapore or around that region, it's a very late night. And uh, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and wait till sort of we finish and then good night. Uh, my hope is through this uh, introductory webinar is to tell you a little bit about the course. Uh, this course is about machine learning. Uh, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, statistics, these are all disciplines that are very closely interconnected. This course, we will spend quite a bit of time and effort discussing the similarities and differences between them. Machine learning, if you know about it, uh, you must have heard of a variety of different things, variety of different topics, variety of different keywords, uh, variety of different successes that have come around lately, especially in the popular media. And then you must be wondering, what is it about? So this course is about what and how to do machine learning. Okay? In any engineering course, any engineering scientific course, there are roughly three parts. You want to know what is machine learning or what is the topic. You want to know uh, how to do that, how to enable it, and then why those are the right things to do it. And what we'll try to do is we'll try to spend quite a bit of time understanding what, how, and some whys. Okay? And again, sort of whys get very mathematical and detailed, and that's why sort of we'll try to avoid that, but we'll talk about what and how. That way you understand the landscape of machine learning. Historically, machine learning has been collection of methods, models, algorithms, topics. It's been, if you look at some of the modern methods of machine learning, they have a history of more than 150 years old. However, machine learning as a term was coined only in 1950s or early 60s. Traditionally, the machine learning started with pattern recognition, computers learning from data, but over time, it has evolved to become a, a part of different methods put together. And what I have tried to do in this course, and this is how I teach at MIT as well, is try to put a mission statement that explains all the topics of machine learning. And the mission statement from my perspective, and this is one important lens, is machine learning can be viewed as going from data to insights and decisions. Okay, so again, this course is taught with a lens of going from data to insights and decisions. Through that, I would explain how all the things that are out there in machine learning enable this process. Now, of course, if you learn about some process and you might view that as a, from a different lens and that's fine. But again, with any topic, it's very important to have one place where we can actually tie the fabric nicely. And this is, in my mind, the unique lens that sort of I like to use it uh, to teach this course. Okay. With that, it's about data to begin with. 
and data needs to stay somewhere data needs to be collected data needs to be processed uh, data needs to be managed stored etc this is what a data management platform does this is what a good software solution or good a combination of software and hardware solution does a combination of sensors along with many of the database systems or data file systems and all that will do we do not discuss that in this course that is an extremely important important component of machine learning that is data those are important uh, the twin piece for machine learning to be become enabled that is having access to data stored to data process data manage data okay so, but in this course we will assume that that exists but you must remember that that's an extremely important starting point now that you have data and you want to get insights from it and make decisions there are roughly four steps and this is how we go through the process first we take the data we dissect it we understand it we make sense of it once we understand what your data is about for example if you are a retailer and you have collected all sorts of data about your customers about your products about your transactions about your inventory you would like to understand what sells what does not sell who is buying what why what is trending what is not trending this is all about understanding your data this is about historical things in um, business world at some level this is also synonymous to what i would call business intelligence okay so this is the first step understand your data once you understand your data you know that well this blue sweater sold well last march question is that what is it going to sell well this march that's about forecasting it's about prediction predictions are also about unknowns i know something about uh, let's say babak's uh, Baba, i know babak's picture but i don't know his age given everything else can i predict his age of course his age is here it's not in future but it's an unknown to me i want to predict that okay if you have a noisy information you want to denoise it all of these are part of prediction methods there are a variety of approaches for that primarily they get classified into three things regression classification and neural networks neural networks are workhorse and modern approaches to make these things feasible neural networks are also very useful to understand data and all of these things we discuss in this course okay understanding your data is the first thing predictions unknowns denoising that's the next step once you have done these two steps that is now you know that well blue sweater is going to sell this much and red sweater is going to sell this much in next march now you have to make decisions you have 100 dollars to spend towards your inventory you want to potentially maximize your profit while retaining your revenue at least above certain thing and now the question is that what are the decisions you should make what are the inventories you should buy where should you place them though that's an objective driven decisions with the knowledge of uncertainty knowledge of uncertainty is captured through predictive model about from historical data about what people are going to buy and what people are not going to buy of course you won't have exact accurate information but maybe you will have some model of uncertainty saying that well it's likely that people are going to buy this thing between 10 and 12 things in the third step we discuss in detail the foundations the formal language that provides a way to think about variety of decision making questions not only just a simple question that we discuss in the context of uh placing blue and red sweater but also how do you design an automated go player how do you think about automated driving how do you think about managing your financial portfolio and variety of other uh scenarios we discuss in depth under decision making scenario in this webinar in few minutes we'll do a little bit in depth overview of the type of things we will cover under decision making uh, under uncertainty and then finally what you want to do is you want to understand whether the decisions that you took did it work or not okay now here as you are seeing uh, on your screen we are going to ask you your opinion your opinion your input about what sorts of data that you you encounter remote 
Okay. And again, the whole point here is that at the end of the day, we need to start with the data. If you have data, you would like to do something with it. You would love to understand what sorts of data motivates you to think about machine learning. I'm going to give you a few minutes or a few seconds rather. And maybe now uh, we can, hopefully you all have provided your input, click the buttons, and now we can sort of go to the results. So here is a set of results that we have collected. As you can see, a large number of individuals, this 35%, uh, are motivated by operational data, and that makes sense. 20%, um, that is one-fifth of them, by customer data. 30% talk about all the data that is including financial and third-party data. And of course, 10% or so are financial and roughly the same from third-party data. So really this is uh, how we have seen division coming around. In a sense, no, it's not a surprise that operational data, how one thinks of IoT in a broader sense is becoming a key for many of us to think about bringing machine learning. So now what I want to do is, as we discussed four steps, right? Um, understanding your data, building predictive model or model of uncertainty, using the model of uncertainty with objective to make optimized decisions. And then now that we have made decisions, understanding what worked, what did not work. I went to a store to buy a toothpaste. And when I was at the store, I realized that there's a coupon that's available for the toothpaste. So I'm buying it, my toothpaste with a coupon. Now you as a retailer are going to say that I bought a toothpaste with a coupon. Did I buy it because you sent me coupon or did it happen that I was there and buying toothpaste and I use coupon? You don't know that. Question is, is there a way to do that correct attribution, especially as you run your marketing campaign and whatnot? This attribution, question of attribution is a really difficult one. And this is where the challenges of causal inference are addressed. These are the type of things we discussed in the course. Here, what I want to do is talk about decision making under uncertainty. So decision making under uncertainty, as we've discussed, has fundamentally two parts. One is understanding the uncertainty, that is build a good predictive model to capture uncertainty. Going back to that simple retail example, building model of uncertainty about what would your customers like or not like a demand. The second one, given that model of uncertainty, we want to utilize to optimize the decision that you care about, especially while balancing risk and reward. For example, if you know that the likelihood of customers buying your product is between nine to 12, if you go to nine, what you're doing is you are going for a lower bound, which means that all your customers will potentially buy all of that, but there's a chance that a customer will walk in and they will find nothing. If you went to 12, well, maybe you will not have any customers walking away, but you might have products that you might have to liquidate it or just throw them away at the end of the season. So question is, how do you balance the risk of losing money and the rewards that you can get? And you want to do that carefully. An important thing that you must think about is how does your decision impact not only immediate future that is coming season, but long-term season. For example, let's suppose that you decided that, you know, you want to be very conservative. You don't want to have products that can lead to a setting where you need to liquidate them. So you're going to be conservative and you're going to have a few products. Great. No losses this season, but what could happen is your revenue and footprint in the market is shrunk. And if you continue doing this, your revenue and footprint in market continues shrinking till you go out of business. So maybe that's not a great idea. So maybe you want to think about long-term and with the intent of allowing yourself to have um, longer, longer term presence, you might want to think about having a more uh, set of products, even at the cost of losing some money. So really it's about balancing this long-term and short-term rewards that you need to think carefully. And you as a decision maker have to think about how to balance them. Another important challenge that shows up in decision making is a question of exploration and exploitation. Okay, so let's uh, understand this from simple example of pink sweater for young girls. And I use this example all the time, but it's 
very uh, it's very personal at some level for me and it's it's a real example but it also captures the complexity of this uh, thing so as we all know at least where i live uh, pink is a color for young girls and blue is a color for young boys what that means is that if you want to buy a sweater for a young girl think of a girl of age four or five really finding a blue sweater is really hard even blinding a shade of different shades of blue and maybe black is also very hard okay so then what happens is that you go online or you go in a store and you're looking for that and you won't be able to buy it maybe you really want to actually because hey you know you like um, a shade of blue uh, for your young girl and you're happy to even pay 15 percent extra 20 percent extra you won't be able to find it and retailers because they know historically that pink sells well they're only manufacturing pink only putting that in this uh, store. So now the question is, retailers have effectively lost an opportunity of potentially 10% of the population that was ready to pay 15% more for these blue sweaters for young girls and they don't even know. So question is, how do they know it? Well, the only way to know it is to try it, is to explore it. If you exploit well, that is just sell pink, of course you're gonna do well, but you will lose an opportunity that you don't know about. If you explore too much and put out all sorts of sweaters, maybe you're wasting your resources. The question is, how do you balance these two things? In a sense, exploration and exploitation, balancing these two things are fundamental to most decision-making data gathering things. It's like the challenge that we are facing as we think about thinking about you know, ethics and fairness in the automated decision-making systems these days. The problem is that we are utilizing the historical data to build the predictive models to make decisions. Now, since historical data took only certain type of decisions, we only understand what that leads to and we are exploiting that. And we are not exploring the other options. And because of that, the decision-making tools, automated decision-making tools are biased as one would call it. So really exploration and exploitation is at the core of this biasness. So if you want to unbiased, we need to explore. There's no other way to uh, come up with automated decision-making tools that are not unbiased. All right, so with that, what I want to do now is briefly talk about a formal framework of decision-making that allows us to think about all of these aspects simultaneously and carefully address them in a more formal manner so that we can have algorithms that we can design and we can implement them and we can actually bring it to practice. So with that, what I would like to do is discuss the framework of decision making. And here I want to think about a decision making scenario where you as an agent is the algorithm, the decision maker, the one that takes action. And there is an everything else is an environment. You observe the aspects of environment through what I would call state environment produces reward when you take action and then environment may change or not change thinking of this in an ongoing manner you as an agent take action action leads to changing environment or state you observe the new reward and the state and you continue and what is going to happen is historically you would have collected lots of data about these kind of things agent taking action leading to change in environment, leading to a new state, leading to reward, et cetera, et cetera. And from there, you want to build a policy, a policy, a decision-making algorithm that tells you what is the best decision to make when you are at a given state. One example, it's classic, simple, but all of us can understand and really difficult one is chess playing. So imagine that you were assigned to build an algorithm for building an automated chess player. Now, what you really want to do, that means is that every time you see a board position, you have some possible options that are available. You can move a rook, you can move a queen, you can move a pawn maybe, you maybe move a horse. Question is that which one to move? And the goal would be of course ultimately win, but in the process you also want to take away your opponent's uh, pieces as quickly as possible. So for example, every time you make a move, your reward could be the loss or gain that you have had in the piece. 
When you make a move, of course, board position changes. So there's nothing unknown about it. But there's one thing that's unknown. After you move, your opponent makes a move. You don't know how your opponent is going to move. Okay. So in a sense, if you are playing with an opponent who has played a lot, like if I and Babak have played chess many times, then I have a mental model of how Babak will play. For a computer, it's about looking at Babak's historical data and say, well, whenever Babak is in this position, he's likely to make this move versus that move. Okay. That's the model of uncertainty that we, from historical data, have learned. We're going to utilize that. That will tell us how environment is going to change, the board positions are going to change, and then using that, and based on the rewards we have obtained from historical data, we're going to continue to building an algorithm. But this is how, as I explained, chess beautifully fits into this simple but powerful framework. Let's take another example. Uh, another example of retail. And again, going back to selling sweaters. And let's assume that all we're doing is selling sweaters for young girls and all we have is options in terms of what color sweaters we can sell. So our decision at each decision cycle, be it weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, six monthly, three monthly, when we are trying to decide what is the new inventory to bring in, we need to look at our current state of inventory, that's our state. We need to just look at, think about what our customer's demand would be. We buy a new set of things. Those are our actions. Depending on what customers buy or sell, that leads to rewards, and then we continue with this. Again, in the long term, we want to get as much out of it as possible. Now, now that we understand the formal language, we understand what is ultimate goal, we understand what are the intellectual challenges. We took a few examples that helps us understand how it fits nicely into formal language. Let's do the following. Let's understand how we can sort of develop methods and algorithms for this. And methods and algorithm for each of the scenario nicely classifies into four settings. And these four settings the way I would like to think about them is they're classified based on how much state keeps changing every time you make a decision and how much information you have about model of uncertainty of the environment. Okay. And that I would call state dynamics and information. If your state is changing a lot, that's a high dynamics. State is not changing, at least for the purpose of your decision making cycle, that's a low dynamics. If a lot of information you have about the uh, environment in terms of what's going to happen, that's a high information. If you have a little information, that's a low information. Now, one may ask the question whether something is high or low. Really, you, the course, the methods provide approaches for each of them, but you need to decide what is low and what is high. Okay, And then based on that, and based on historical data, potentially you can use methods in a data-driven manner to decide which one fits your setting better. Here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through four cases or four examples for each one of them that will give you some idea of how to think about that. In the course, we go into a detailed approaches to think about each one of these cases, many examples, and what are the methods you would use for each one of them, how do you utilize your data, how do you solve a specific example problems, and so on and so forth. Here, I want to just give you a flavor. So first example is low state dynamics and high information. This is a very nice example of this scenario is annual planning for retail. So let's imagine you are a big retailer, you've been in business for 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, you've got lots of information about your customers, how you're chain of stores work, how your supply chain works, how uh, your inventory are managed, how products look like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So you've got lots of information. That means your information is very high. You've got a good model of uncertainty. What's going to happen coming here? Now, again, your customers might be changing. There might be a trend, but based on the information you have, you have reasonable understanding of what's going to happen. Of course, there are unusual things that is going to happen. Nobody knows, and there's nothing you can do about it. But for the purpose of planning your decision for the next year, you're going to make a decision now and you're not going to change it, which means for all practical purposes, for your decision cycle, your world is fixed. That means state is not changing. And that is the situation where annual planning for retail, low state dynamics, lots of information. 
But now let's change a bit. Let's go to the example where, you know, you are a retailer who is just setting up the shop. Let's say, imagine I go to shopify.com and I set up my own new e-shop. And now I have no idea how my customers look like. All I know is that I want to sell sweaters for young girls. And that means I've got few designs of websites that I can show. Maybe on the first landing page, all I can show is a pink, or maybe I can show pink and blue, or maybe I can do something else. So I don't know which are the best options for my customers because I have no data. So what I'll do is I'll set up one thing, start collecting data as more and more of my customers start interacting. And based on that, I'm getting new information. But as far as my customers are concerned, they're not changing. So really my state, which I don't know and how environment, it's not changing, but that means dynamics is low, but I have very little data about it. So these are the two examples where state is effectively fixed, but information is either high or information is either low. Now let's take examples of when state is dynamic and let's shift from retail to chess. Now imagine that you're playing chess with a known opponent. Let's imagine uh, somebody like Vishwanath Anand, Gary Kasparov, Anatoly Karpo, somebody like that. People who have played lots of games, which means that you have a lot of data about them, which means that you know that most likely when Vishwanath Anand is faced with a given board position, he's likely to make move queen with 30% chance, a rook with 80%, sorry, 70% chance. And that means that you've got a very good understanding of what he's going to do. Using this, which means a lot of information about Vishwanath Anand, you've got a good predictive model of uncertainty. When you move your any pawn, state constantly changes, it means state dynamics is very high. So this is a very nice example of high state dynamics, lots of data. But now imagine that you're suddenly going to start playing with me and you've never played, even though I'm a terrible player, but you still don't know what I'm going to do. And so that means that you have no information, no model of me in terms of playing a chess. And again, because it's a chess, world keeps changing all the time. Board keeps changing all the time. So state dynamics is very high. So in a sense, these are four examples. Each example needs a different way to think about how we develop method. And depending on which example fits your scenario of interest, you need to apply methods from that. You might find yourself in a situation where you don't know exactly which one is what you might want to do a data driven study where you say, well, let me think of my day, my setup fitting case four, and let me sort of use utilize method from that and then see how well am I doing by historically simulating the data and apply case three and see which one is works better. And then that might help you decide which is the right thing to do. It may be the case also, that you might start where you know you are a shop uh, uh, a retailer on Shopify you're just starting and initially you have no data but as you become years old you might start collecting so much data that now you're moving from case two to case one and things like this and so you want to constantly think about your decision making task but again these are the four canonical settings each one of them have their own collection of methods we discuss in depth how to utilize these methods and that can help you solve these problems. All right, so in a nutshell, machine learning is about going from data to insights and decisions. Now what I want to do is go through a few of the questions that we usually get in this kind of forum. So I want to quickly go through some of those questions first. Uh, Babak is of course going to help me go through them. And then uh, we have a question and answer forum where I'm pretty sure many of you are writing questions and you would continue writing questions as we go along. And depending on how much time we have, we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And of course, the questions that we cannot answer, uh, please don't worry, we'll try our best to get back to you with those. All right, so first question. Why would you take machine learning program? And more importantly, why would you take now? So um, short answer is that we're going through a data revolution. Okay. What does that mean? Here's what it means. So historically, if we look at it and going back close to hundred years, uh, when technology became 
really powerful. First, we got transportation that actually changed the way we uh, do businesses across of goods. Then we got physics and mathematics, especially coming post World War II, where they revolutionized the way we think about our businesses, the way we do businesses, the way they enabled the businesses. Silicon, for example, was one of the prime outcome of that the machines that you and I are using right now to communicate. Um, and then came the computers outcome of those things and computers, especially the personalized computers changed the way we managed information going from papers to bits and that and the way we communicate and that has led to a completely different uh, revolution IT revolution. We all learned how to use computers, how to use Excel, how to do emails, then came internet, then came the phones with the apps. We have learned all of those things. And now what has happened is we are in a situation where we have collected so much data from all sorts of sensors and we are continually collecting them. We have access to them. And now we need to figure out what to do with it. That information is sitting there. And what we really need to do is to make that information usable in all our day-to-day -day job, just the way you use Excel, you don't need to be Excel specialist. There are no Excel specialists. We all use Excel. Similarly, we need to be machine learning specialists, all of us. So that's why I believe this is the time for one to take machine learning and make machine learning as a part of your natural additional skill set, not the end goal, but a, a skill set that helps you go towards your end goal better. Exactly, and I would just add to Professor Shaw's that. You may not need a technical person, data scientist of the team that would end up doing everything in details and code the whole framework, but you are interacting on a daily basis with, uh, with the analytics team. You may be having data scientists or people with the machine learning background reporting to you on a daily basis. So um, not knowing what these algorithms are, not knowing what the techniques are, would just slow down the process. So I think today more than ever, we all need to know about how to leverage data using these methods. Thank you, Babar. Uh, next question. What kind of questions can machine learning help answer? Fantastic. So, uh, sorry, we can stay on the previous question. Yes, so um, first of all, as we discussed, machine learning is about going from data to insights and decisions. So all the questions that can in a meaningful manner be answered using your data will be answered. So if you don't have data and if you want to answer a question, that will be a little difficult. It's like, how do aliens look? Uh, I think it's difficult because uh, at least uh, from what I understand, scientifically recorded setting, we don't, we don't have a good idea of how do aliens look. So that's one. Second, if you have data, then you can use that to understand sort of what's going to happen or make a model of uncertainty. As we discussed uh, in this class and start by sort of uh, just thinking about what is a way to think about predictions, a simple tagline that I like to use is the following. Future of past is future of future. Putting it other way, how would your tomorrow, that is your Saturday look like? Well. Let's go historically look at all the Fridays that looked like today. Let's look at those historical Saturdays after those Fridays. Build a model of uncertainty about your tomorrow Saturday from that. And maybe that will help you decide how your tomorrow Saturday look like. But hey, you know what? Tomorrow, if you're going to win a lottery and you never won a lottery, it's impossible for machine learning to help predict that. Next question. And this uh, is an, uh, a next layer of question where, you know, now we're going from uh, a high level question to a little bit more detail. What is the difference between regression and classification? Well, regression and classification both are types of predictive problems. Let's imagine that I'm wearing one of those variable devices that tracks my, you know, uh, all sorts of things. And for those are gathering, censoring, uh, gathering censored information. Maybe it also knows uh, my ethnicity, my age, a little bit about my maybe genes and all that. And based on that, it wants to predict my expected age or my life, uh, lifetime. 
that's a number that it's trying to predict 89.37 years or 61.23 years or maybe i believe i hope that it's 222 years but that's a number it's a number that's trying to predict and that's a regression problem when you are trying to predict something which is structured a nice thing then it's called regression on the other hand if you take an image and you are trying to figure out whether it has a cat or a dog that task where you're coming up with a label unstructured blue or green there's no number that connects how close is a green to blue and so on that's classification okay you look at somebody's historical data and say what is the likelihood of this person if i give this person a certain financial loan what is the likelihood of this person defaulting with the person default or not it's a zero or one it's a classification What type of problems are best solved by neural networks? Well, neural networks are beautiful functional approximations. They've been around for now uh, close to, let's say since 1940s. Uh, they have had a life where in 1940s they were around in 50s everybody loved them and then 60s people forgot and 70s and 80s they came back and 90s again everybody loved them and 2000s people forgot and now everybody loves them again. It's one of those method that's been around for a while, over years, there have been a variety of innovations that have made these methods more and more powerful. Neural networks, because what they're called function approximation, they're fundamental to most machine learning tasks. For example, they can help us do solve regression and classification problem. They're particularly powerful in working with unstructured data or input, such as text, images, and whatnot. They're also very good at building model of your unstructured and structured data so that that can help you understand your data. So just that they are the ones who can build a model of data and then say, hey, you know what? Here is how a natural new human might look like. Okay. Great. And I just add to that uh, what Professor Shaw said about neural network. I know uh, for many people before taking a machine learning course, they think machine learning is neural network. They think neural network is machine learning. Neural network is just another algorithm, of course, very powerful, of course, used probably more than anything else nowadays uh, that helps us to do uh, all those prediction tasks, all those classification tasks. Um, and when you hear the word black box is mostly referring to neural network given the structure that it has. Uh, and through this course, you would also learn about that. Um, so Professor Shaw, if you don't mind for the next few slides, I'm just gonna give an overview of the course. Um, so week zero uh, begins on February 4th and it follows by eight modules. So in week zero, we just uh, introduce you the platform, how to get through the, the modules, the assessments and so on. Then we start by eight modules. The first one is just introduction of the course, so a big high level, um, intro to uh, the decision making in the age of AI and machine learning. And, and the second uh, week in understanding your data, we go from data visualization to uh, data dimension redu reduction to cluster analysis, not only applied to numerical data, we, we also give you an intro to how to apply cluster analysis to documents, something called uh, topic modeling, or uh, you can call it natural language processing models. Topic modeling is an algorithm of natural language processing models. Then we move to the prediction phase. And for that, we have three um, separate weeks. We start with regression modeling. Um, we go over the course, the algorithms, the model that are being used. Then we move to classification. And we just explain how different are regression versus classification. In one, you're predicting a value. In the other one, you are predicting a class, a category. And then we wrap up that uh, section of predictions with neural networks. And you get to see how neural networks are designed, how architectured to solve different problems from simple regression problem to um, image detection, object identification. You learn about convolutional neural networks and how they are used in practice. Then you have two very good modules on decision making and this is the future of ai now that not that we are not doing it now but this is where the when you hear about ai that's where the machine learning actually comes into play and that's about decision making how do we put these methods together 
to make an agent making decisions on its own as it's moving forward. And that's the ultimate goal of what uh, researchers have been trying to do, that can we have these models make decisions on their own as they are moving forward. So in uh, decision-making foundation and application, to get you a little bit uh, intro uh, in touch of what this whole decision-making framework with machine learning is. And we wrap up the course in week number eight by talking about causal inferences. And that goes from hypothesis testing to something done on a daily basis for uh, almost all the tech companies, um, which is something like A-B testing. And in doing so, within those last weeks, we also talk about multi-arm bandits and how different they are from A-B testing. So that's a brief overview of um, the course outline. For each week, for each module, we have video lectures recorded by Professor Shaw. We have weekly assessments. They could be from multiple choices to discussion boards. Some of the discussion boards are optional or they're not graded. Some of them are graded. We want you to go and explore something and give us the feedback. We have learning facilitator going over your assessments and give you feedback and grade those. And within each of those weeks, whenever applicable, we try to offer two types of assignments. One for people which wanted to do a little bit more technical, a um, little bit more math oriented, quant oriented. At the same time, some uh, problems were designed to target more um, high level questions, more managerial implications of those methods that we were learning. Um, just to clarify, I'm going to go over the q and A. I, I'm sure that question has come up by now that are you going to learn a programming language? Not in this course. This is an introduction to machine learning course. A programming language uh, a machine learning course would be something that comes after this. First, to introduce you through this course to all the fundamentals, all the pillars of machine learning, all the core ideas that we have. Uh, but there won't be any programming uh, like R or Python or everything else. However, um, we have some optional demos, and these are, these are totally optional. Like they're not going to be part of your, your course ass assessment, that we provided you with some data, real data sets, and we introduce you to some online platforms. Again, it's not coding, but it gives you a chance to practice some of the methods that we have on data sets um, to give you a little bit more of hands-on experience. In terms of the completion of the course, you would get the certificate if you complete 80% of all the required activity through the course. The certificate is, uh, is a blockchain certificate that you can use it on your LinkedIn and other social media platform. Uh, it's this, this certificate is also counted as 6.4 credits, which you can use towards any other degrees and certificate. And we also always have this fire hydrant award by MIT that would be awarded to someone that has been doing exceptional throughout the course. Um, for that, we have our, our learning facilitator give us weekly feedback on your activities, where, how active you were in discussion boards, in um, office hours, or in helping everyone else by sharing what you know, or sharing different interesting links. Perhaps one of the best parts of this course is, is your interaction with, the part, with other participants through the course. And just to give you a sense of the background of people that took this course before, as you can see, around 60% of people had up to 15 years of experience. And they are coming from different industry, from IT, from healthcare, uh, and uh, consulting, name it. So a very good value you take from a course like this at a place like MIT is the, in, the interaction, the networking part. Through all these discussion boards, you get to interact with other people. You get to learn about their uh, experience. We start week zero by asking you to introduce yourself about what you do, what areas of machine learning is interesting to you, and what uh, you may be applying those methods on a daily basis. And just right there, you can see um, how, what uh, background people have, and you start connecting with them through those eight weeks that you have. Uh, and that's a great value you would get out of the course. And I've been, uh, we have been running this course for a um, few iterations. It's been one of the most successful online courses I've seen. The feedbacks have been great. Again, it gives you a very good understanding of machine learning um, in summary, like again, every single of those weeks could be a standalone course, but 
when you finish this course, you gotta have a good understanding of what data scientists are doing, what problems are they solving, and where the field is moving forward. And as, as I'm going over the registrations, which is uh, the details, there will be a link showing up in your chat box which you can uh, follow to go to register for the course. The deadline is February 3rd. And as I told you, week zero would be launching on February 4th. It's eight weeks, excluding the first week. And uh, we did an overview of all the, the modules so far. And a little bit about MIT Professional Education. MIT Professional Education was founded in 1949. It's positioned under MIT School of Engineering. The courses, the offerings are all faculty led. And it has multiple programs, from short programs to custom programs for corporates, for organizations, to international program. So this is where MIT links with people outside MIT and the corporates by offering uh, courses by MIT uh, faculty. With that, uh, we're right on time. I'm going to go uh, over some of the questions that you have posted. Uh, and uh, the ones that I can answer regarding the course, I will, and the rest, I will pass it to Professor Shah. So Martin asked which software we'll be using. I think Martin, I already answered that. It won't be a software, uh, even though you you can, in, in, through your interaction with learning facilitator, you may be directed to what would, meet, would be matching what you want to learn in the future, either if it's going to be R, Python, or something else. But the course itself won't have any uh, program. Matt says, will this cover sales forecasting using tools um, such as Excel? Um, it, we won't have, again, it's if we're not uh, focusing on a, on a tool specifically, but are we going to talk about forecasting and sales? Yes. One of Professor Shaw's expertise is in the retail market. And uh, through most of the modules, you would see that how we link these methods to uh, retail forecasting, retail inventory management, also how to put up your products on, uh, on your e-commerce website and so on. So that would be that. Will any time be spent regarding ethics concerning in machine learning and AI? Well, not specifically, but through the, I've always had these conversations when we had office hours about explainable AI, about biases in machine learning and AI, about fairness in AI. Again, there is no senior modules or slide necessarily on that, but this conversation uh, flows over the whole course of the, the program. It's one of the areas of interest for me. Um, in fact, I'll be on a panel later today talking about responsible digital transformation. So I've been reading even more in the last two weeks. And I've always learned through the conversation I had through this course uh, with uh, students. Which softwares and programming languages are we going to be using? So I think I, I did talked about that, Internet Application Platform. Um, predictive data based on current use of expected sales. Well, even I I read uh, your statement, it was not more of a question or Professor Shah, if you think that's the question, okay. uh, it was I think very, very specific. So, sorry, which question? Even Harvis or Jarvis, sorry if I'm- Yeah, even Jarvis, so need to make an application for platform that incorporates sales, supply, manufacturing, raw material, demand supply basis, um, need to use predictive data. Uh, this is an excellent point. Uh, I think sort of definitely uh, we are in a place where we need uh, uh, we need um, a lot of help to put a variety of different data that are coming together. I think we are in a, we are in an interesting world right now where again we're going through transition. So where we were to where we want to end up. And this is where sort of I think we are in the middle and what your point you're making even is exactly along those lines. So my hope is that through, uh, through sort of things, uh, courses like this and individuals like yourself and sort of the collectively, we will actually lead to a place where what you are suggesting is where we will be. In a sense, you know, uh, machine learning on one hand, while we sort of are doing something very um, in a bigger scheme of things, uh, given what nature is, we are doing something very minuscule. Uh, but our hope is that maybe if uh, if people utilized um, 
simple uh, data driven operations and made their houses efficient in terms of how they utilize energy and maybe made their lives efficient in terms of how they utilize transportation at least will do a little bit of uh, change to the world and there will be more chances of saving it than not perfect thank you and there are two questions professor shah that they are kind of related one it says how much time it takes to make an algorithm and the second one is does the course cover on how to build an mi pipeline so the simple answer to that second question is no but i would like you to to shed some light on those two questions please sure definitely so i think uh, aldo uh, finetti's question is how much time it takes to make an algorithm so i i would interpret this as given a problem how how long does it take for one to come up with an algorithm that's one interpretation well uh, the hope is that through this course you will learn methods and algorithms that are out there so that you would look at your problem and you would say well here are the type of approaches i want to use another question that could be is that well or interpretation of this is well here is an algorithm and now i want to implement in practice well this depends on how you go about it if uh, your problem is small scale and you simply want to solve one problem at a given time maybe you can simply uh, as babak said use a simple python uh, or r setup and solve it but if you want to build a production grade system that may take more than that and i think that's actually nicely relates to muthahira's question uh, muthahira yasmina uh, asks that does the course cover how to build ml pipelines short answer is we don't walk you through specifically building ml pipelines uh, what this course is doing is talking about what is machine learning and how to do machine learning and times why those aspects and why is where the technical pieces come together we don't sort of walk you through building those things however i think if you are interested in this it would be a great thing to do that is you take while you are taking the course there are lots of help that's available as babak said through learning facilitators you can actually indulge yourself and build it and again this has been a systematic uh, decision that we as we, we developed the course to decide that uh there's only one there's a type of flavor that we chose for this course and our goal was to uh provide people understanding of what machine learning is exactly thank you uh, maria asked uh, and i'm going to answer that how technical is the optional taking part of the course let me cle be clear about that uh as i said within the assessments there will be some assessments which are a little bit more technical the uh, they ask about the numbers and regarding the formulas it's not going to be that technical anything that you will be assessed on it will be shown on um, the slides and the video lectures that they are not that technical but they are more technical than the other parts which are focusing on just the managerial uh, implications of the methods that said as i told you there is an optional demo and those optional demos are just to give you a data set and um they we we found some online platforms which has most of these methods built in there won't be any coding but you can go and practice and see what if i have this data set and i want to do this sort of pre predictions how would that work and that there was another question down the road about training and through those optional demos you would get to experience what do we mean by training an algorithm going from just showing part of the data and then keeping the whole out data set and um applying your models uh your predictive models to that whole out data set so you get to through those demos practice a little bit of training but again doesn't involve any code um let me uh, uh jump to uh, maria's next question that uh how does this course compare to other machine learning course offered by MIT i don't know about the sloan course sure. in machine learning and business professor shah if you know yeah yeah so i think um uh the the short answer is that it's um uh, the other course is very specific in a very business centric view and so of course it's uh, limited in its own scope and uh, specialized the purpose of this course it's um, uh, so for example i teach machine learning the machine learning class uh, at mit in electrical engineering and computer science that's taken by more than 400 students every semester uh, and really the purpose of that this course was to bring that knowledge for the people broader audience that's not necessarily going to classroom every day 
for their education right now. But uh, folks who are out there, such as yourself, who have a potentially very distinguished uh, career in your own field, but then you want to sort of catch up with what's happening in the world of machine learning. And this provides the holistic view of the machine learning as a topic. It's not just specific to business as per se. Of course, we use many examples and applications to explain how things translate, but that's not the primary purpose. This is about telling you how, what is the mission statement of machine learning and how everything we know about machine learning ties together nicely. Uh, thank you, Professor Shah. I'm, I'm scrolling over the question. I'm trying to answer those which are more related to the course itself. Uh, there was one that uh, I believe Hakan asked, and I'm going to well, Hakan asked which specific, uh, would there be discussions on ridge regression, lasso regression, and so on. Yes, we would cover ridge and lasso within the regression uh, module, so done with that. Uh, I think Sheila asked the questions about the background of the learning facilitator. Thank you, Sheila, for that question. Learning facilitator are all machine learning experts. Uh, and uh, they are either from academia or industry, so we have a mix of those. Whenever they have office hours, uh, even though you might have like in different sections of the course, but all these office hours that they are hosting, which would be throughout the week, is open to, um, to you, so you can choose whatever learning facilitator, um, you, you feel more comfortable going to their office hours or reach out to, so that's for you. Will there be industry speakers during the course? There won't be industry speakers, but Professor Shah would be hosting extra webinars as you go through the course to, to uh, dive down into more details on some of those topics, We're giving you some industry applications of those methods by uh, retail is one of those examples. So we would have, webinars like on top of office hours on top of the video so there would there will be videos there will be office hours and then there will be very specific webinars throughout the course so um that's that um so let me see uh, um, will the course teach how to convert model it says will the, the course teach how to convert model results such as accuracy into business friendly indicators Again, um, Sheila, uh, there, will be, there will be conversations about many of these things, some of them a little bit more specific, some of them a little bit more uh, general. So I can't really say if the, question, the answer to that question is yes or uh, so no. So I think sort of maybe uh, if I interpret another way I interpret your question, Sheila, is that would there be a way to think about uncertainty, let's say in predictions, for example? and how that translates into the specific objective that you care about. So we'll definitely talk about notion of uncertainty, how to interpret it. Uh, and then of course, when you view the method in specific application, you might uh, come across, how do you think about uncertainty within that context? Okay. So one question I grab, as I, I went over what you guys wrote over there, one is, do I need to have like, do I need to know stats to start this course? No, you can come with any background and you would leave this course with a good understanding of machine learning, but don't assume uh, knowledge of the stats. Yes, it may help you to understand better some of the methods that we go into the depth, but definitely not. We would also provide you with glossary of terms or extra links whenever needed that you would go and read on your own and come back so you can benefit more from the course. That said, there was another, there were one or two uh, participants asking about the live webinar sessions times. Uh, they are in different times, so we make sure everyone would have a chance to log in live. Regardless, they will be also posted, the webinars would be also recorded and posted on the platform. So if you miss one, you can always go back and rewatch it. The office hours, again, are throughout the week on different times, so you can find the ones that uh, would match your schedule better. With that, we have only like 10 seconds left. Um, I'm sorry that I couldn't answer every, everyone else's questions. Please reach out to, um, to us if you have further questions regarding the course. Uh, and with that, Professor Shah, thank you so much for your time. And thank you for everyone who logged in. I'm looking forward to having you uh, through those eight weeks of the course. Professor right. Shah, any thank final? You. Well, thank you. And I hope to sort of see you in the course and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night.
Thank you so much. And again, there will be a survey link at the end. Please take that survey and give us any feedback that you have. Enjoy the rest of your day, evening and night, wherever you are. And if, for those of you who are celebrating a lunar year, happy new year uh, in advance. Yes.